Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Todd Green, president of the Memorial Art Gallery's Board of Managers. Welcome to all of you to our webinar today with Darren Walker. And I would like to extend an especially warm welcome to several guests, including Monroe County Executive Adam Bellow, Deputy Mayor of the City of Rochester, James Smith, President and CEO of the Rochester Area Community Foundation, Jennifer Leonard, and a very special welcome to the MAG's Director's Advisory Council. I'm delighted that all of you are able to join us today for this extraordinary occasion, and I'm excited and proud to welcome Darren Walker, President of the Ford Foundation. To help introduce Darren, I would like to invite Jonathan Binstock, the MAG's Executive Director, to say a few words. Thank you, Todd. Thank you very much. Darren Walker is a passionate and strategic leader and one of the most prominent figures in the global struggle for social justice. As president of the Ford Foundation, which has a $13.7 billion endowment and in 2019 awarded $520 million in grants, Darren leads one of the largest engines for social justice in the world. And I can tell you that when times get tougher, Darren Walker gets tougher too. As I speak, he and the Ford Foundation are leading an effort among a number of major foundations to substantially increase giving beyond their current capacity by borrowing large sums of money. In addition, Darren is everywhere these days, in the news, webinars, online, here in Rochester, and he is an increasingly public intellectual and a steady guiding light for all of us in the quest and search and fight for social justice around the world. He and the Ford Foundation were major supporters of our amazing Isaac Julian Lessons of the Hour Commission. Thank you, Darren, for this important support, which made that commission possible. I am honored to welcome you to MAG's annual board meeting. And let me just say uh, from the outset, Thank you very, very much from me and from all of the MAG board. We are so excited to have you here with us. Uh, please join this webinar. Thank you very much, Jonathan and Todd, for that very kind and generous welcome. I've been looking forward to this occasion because I remember, uh, Jonathan, when we first talked about Isaac's exhibition, the installation um, at your gallery, and how excited you were, and how excited Isaac was, and how uh, innovative and bold and creative I thought it was of uh, the gallery to present uh, this uh, extraordinary installation by one of the most uh, exciting artists working anywhere in the world today. And I think in many ways it demonstrates that often some of the most interesting uh, and courageous uh, exhibitions uh, are uh, not in New York City or Los Angeles, but are in places where people uh, deeply, deeply appreciate creativity and culture, the humanities, the visual arts, the performing arts, and certainly the University of Rochester and the gallery there has a reputation for this. I want to just spend a few minutes before engaging Jonathan in a conversation with you about this moment we're in, in America, because I am sure you feel, as I do, that we are experiencing a moment in history, unlike anything I have seen in my lifetime. The collective witnessing of the murder of an American citizen, a black man on a street in Minneapolis has unleashed, I think, uh, a convulsion in this country, a reckoning and an awakening of our history, our regrettable history of racism and white supremacy and the regrettable reality that that legacy is present in our contemporary society. So what is the role of an art museum in a moment 
like this? What's the role of artists? Museums have always told us who we are as a society. Museums have always reflected the mirror of who we are. And in the United States, until rather recently, the reflection of who we are really did not reflect who we are. It reflected quite vibrantly one sliver, one very important perspective on who we are. But it was defined in a way that was consistent with our legacy of racism and white supremacy and Eurocentricism, which I do not wish to degrade or demean because it is central to the American narrative and it is central to defining who we are. But it is an incomplete narrative. And that reality is what museums and society at large are dealing with today. The reality that for too long, we have excluded the voices and perspectives and stories and narratives of all of us. And so museums in this moment are doing what museums can do best, which is to interpret, to listen, to create, to provide space for artists, people who love art, people who believe that art can speak to us in ways that words cannot. And museums, like all institutions in this country, are also grappling with the structural racism that has existed throughout time since the founding of the first American museum. Museums have that legacy and are grappling with how to address it. We are seeing how that plays out from the challenges that you've probably all read about at the SF MoMA Museum to the East Coast, the Whitney and the Metropolitan Museum of Art and so many other museums I could list I have spoken with countless directors, board chairs of most of the large museums in this country since the beginning of COVID and certainly since the murder of George Floyd as they grapple with the challenge of rising to this moment as they have made unfortunate missteps as they have not given the right message, not always been sensitive, not listened as well as they need to listen. This is new muscle to be developed for some of our museums and for museum leaders who, as one said to me recently, I was trained to be a curator of European paintings I never learned anything about social justice at the fog. Well, they didn't teach social justice and they didn't teach the idea that art could be a pathway to bringing more justice in society. So today, I believe that the role of the museum is to advance our democratic ideas to provide the space and place for voices, for creativity and free expression to be felt and be a place that is welcoming and embracing of all of the members of its community and be seen as that beacon on the hill that beacon on the hill where we all see that reflection 
of who we are as an American society. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. And I appreciate the opportunity to be with you and your board of managers and have this conversation. Aaron, thank you uh, for your comments. I, for a number of weeks now, and since I learned of your essay, uh, The Value of Civil Society, I've become a bit obsessed with that essay. Um, we in Rochester have, and at the more and more in Art Gallery, have, have, have a rich history of, of, of working hard to welcome um, uh, the full expanse of, of our community. We're not always successful in that regard, and I think we're always finding new ways uh, to advance the effort. But we've been trying for a long time, and I would say in the past five or six years, that's the period of time I'm aware of, we've really um, turned on the the, the turbo boosters or put the pedal to the metal as it were. Um, and, and, um, and thinking about our work in Rochester and thinking about uh, your essay, uh, which is called the Valley of Civil Society, how, how does an art museum strengthen civil society? And um, beyond that, you know, that's a big thing civil society, when you talk about the complexity of a society, even in a smaller city like Rochester, you know, what can one museum do? Well, first of all, a museum is a part of civil society. Sometimes museums see themselves as separate from civil society or in some way above civil society. But museums are a critical part of that ecosystem. I think what museums can do is engage and be a space for engagement with art, with the ideas of beauty, of revelation, of introspection, of engaging with issues of our time, with all of those things. And that doesn't mean that everyone is interested in all of those things. But a museum today has to figure a way to be all of those things because that is the diversity of the community. Um, that is uh, the way in which museums have to evolve to be more inclusive, have to continue to innovate uh, and uh, be uh, uh, creative in ways that uh, museums haven't always had to be. The idea of a museum, quite honestly, was a pretty static idea for most of our history. Um, the, the disciplines were uh, quite uh, calcified. Uh, the norms of presentation, of exhibition, um, the standards, by which uh, everything from accreditation to uh, curatorial curricula was pretty much set until recently. I mean, relatively recently, the last decade, uh, only in the last decade have museums started to reconsider how even to hang a gallery, um, how, I mean, think about it, it was only in 2017 that the Metropolitan Museum of Art incorporated Native American art into the American wing of the museum because Native American art would have been in the old days in the primitive section of the museum with Africana, Oceana, uh, and those primitive cultures and so museums are evolving and in recent years have become less static. And I think that's what you're gonna have to do now is the sort of fluidity the, the, and, and the mechanisms to be agile and to uh, continue to evolve and accelerate that evolution, um, I think is going to be the key to success. Thank you. Um, I've been remiss as a host. I want to tell uh, our, our guests and uh, attendees that 
they can ask questions in the question and answer tab, so uh, which we will turn to in a few minutes. But as you think of your questions, please write them in the Q&A um, tab on your Zoom screen. And um, I believe all the folks who, who need captioning are aware that they can also click on the captioning button for captions. This is um, this this whole event is being um, closed captioned as well. I'm sorry for not mentioning those things at the at the very beginning. Um, Darren, are there you, you have a couple of projects that the or two or three projects that you can speak about whether the Ford Foundation supported these museum projects or you're just aware of these museum projects? What are some of the things that you've seen that have really um, excited you um, that you think are are the right kinds of things that museums uh, for museums to be doing at this time? Well, the things that I've seen, um, and there is so much going on in museums in this country um, that I marvel at. So we have been supporting uh, a series of activities and exhibitions at the museum um, in Jackson, Mississippi, the Mississippi Museum of Art. Mm -hmm. Now, I will say that, um, if I'm to be totally candid, one of my great concerns uh, has been uh, as a leader of a national foundation uh, working across the country and indeed internationally. But as I look at the US, uh, I am a southerner by birth. Uh, I am uh, appalled at the lack of philanthropic support for institutions in the South. Uh, part of that is because there is very little philanthropy in uh, many of these uh, communities. Uh, but it's also, I think, a, a, a regional bias. Um, it's the bias that comes from places like New York and San Francisco, um, where we think that um, if it's not on the East or West Coast, it can't be interesting. And in fact, some of the most interesting um, work going on is not in New York or LA or San Francisco. And so the Mississippi Museum of Art has been addressing this issue of, uh, of race uh, through the visual arts and, and representation over uh, many, many years. And they have taken this on in recent years with some um, really uh, groundbreaking exhibitions. Um, that I uh, have been so impressed by. Uh, and, and, and so for me, the kinds of uh, courageous acts by museums like that, that traditionally were pretty um, straightforward, if you will, uh, I have been incredibly inspired by. Um, I also am inspired by uh, an initiative that uh, we, uh, uh, are partnering with Alice Walton uh, and the Mellon Foundation to diversify the curatorial ranks. Alice came to me in, in conversations very concerned about, as she was opening Crystal Bridges uh, down in, in Bentonville, Arkansas, very concerned that we, uh, she was not finding enough uh, diversity among the curatorial ranks. And so we started this initiative that is really uh, turned out to be uh, with, with 40 institutions, um, uh, a, a, a significant investment and um, a significant increasing in the number of, uh, of, of, of pipeline, of that pipeline for, for, for curators uh, of color uh, and from diverse backgrounds. So that's an exciting one that I uh, have really uh, been inspired by. And the final one is um, an initiative with an organization called Art Bridges, uh, which works with uh, smaller uh, regional and rural uh, uh, cultural uh, centers and museums uh, on presentations that are facilitated through loans from uh, often from museums um, that, especially museums in New York and Chicago and the West Coast and Houston, that have huge collections that are never ever uh, exhibited. Um, and uh, we, we know, and uh, I would imagine Jonathan, uh, you have some works in storage that um, you don't always get to exhibit. And, um, and we have put together this network uh, and the, we fund the facilitation of and the staffing 
um, and the actual curatorial uh, support uh, in places, some of which really only have a part-time curator, for example. Um, so these are, these are uh, uh, El Paso, um, Kalamazoo, um, um, small towns in uh, Missouri and uh, Wyoming, um, places that uh, often don't get um, exhibitions, um, traveling shows, um, and certainly don't have an opportunity on their own because as you know, you know how this works, Jonathan. Uh, I mean, a New York museum is not going to loan a, a, a work to uh, a museum it doesn't have an ongoing relationship with or that isn't a member of the AAD. I mean, all of the things you know um, that actually represent a, a real barrier for a lot of small towns. Um, so this is, from my standpoint, a way of addressing the issue of inequity um, in, in the arts, especially the rural urban um, divide. Mm, thank you. Um, uh, we have a question that uh, tags on to uh, what you're just talking about. Can you talk a little bit more about the pipeline for curators of color? Um, what do these programs entail in addition to working with Alice um, Walton on this and Crystal Bridges? Um, are there other uh, organizations spearheading? Sure. Uh, there are. Uh, there is uh, a, an organization founded by the arts patron um, Agnes Gund uh, called the Center for Curatorial uh, Leadership. Um, there uh, is an organization at Bard College um, that is also um, investing in supporting uh, curators of, of color and diverse curators. Uh, and, the, and the goal is to um, get uh, those uh, uh, young uh, students, uh, at, at, even at the, at the, at the uh, bachelor's level, um, interested in a career uh, as a curator, which often requires an advanced degree, as you know, an MFA usually. Um, and, and how do we get people uh, on track towards that credential um, is a major, major focus. Um, Alice is funding down at Spelman College uh, and a, uh, with a group of HBCUs to uh, increase the pipeline for BFAs there and then to make it possible uh, for those uh, students to then uh, receive an internship and uh, pursue an MFA, hopefully, um, and that will then lead to a career as, as a, a curator. Thank you. Uh, very interesting, very helpful. Um, we talk um, uh, about the um, need for art museums to be relevant and uh, to reflect the society in which they exist um, and, and to be relevant for the communities that may want to visit an art museum. Um, a lot of, uh, and, and, and we talk about art museums having a unique opportunity to, to showcase um, art that engages issues that are topical, that are of the day, that are relevant. Um, often uh, these are very polemical or um, political issues. Um, partisan political activity is uh, meant to be completely out of bounds for public charities. So, um, but then so much art is political. Uh, how, uh, and some board members can feel uncomfortable with displaying art that is overtly political. What would you say to board members who feel trepidatious about MAG showing such art or wading into such waters? Sure. Well, first of all, I challenge the notion that museums, uh, traditional museums have not uh, shown political art. Um, there is uh, a tremendous, uh, in my mind, um, political statement uh, when one uh, looks at the scholarship of Manet's Olympia, uh, the foundational modern art painting, uh, and the scholarship, uh, the exhibitions, uh, the many books written uh, have left uh, the prominent figure of a black woman in that painting rendered invisible in the history of the study of the painting. And that, to my mind, 
is absolutely a political statement. And throughout much of uh, the, the, the American history and the presentation of, of art, which some might consider non-political, um, I think there have been blatant political statements, statements of white supremacy, statements uh, of classism, uh, of regionalism, um, that absolutely are political uh, and cultural and structural. I agree that in this day and age of social media, it is fraught to be engaged in the art of now. Uh, there is no doubt that there is risk uh, and that someone will be offended. Uh, it, there is no way around that. Uh, but I believe that taking the safe route, and what I mean by that is, is saying we can't uh, exhibit uh, art, artists because they're too controversial or too political. Uh, I, I believe that that's, uh, that's a, a, an even bigger risk. I don't advocate being faddish or wanting to be the place where political artists go. That's not what I mean. But I do believe that there is a way to balance uh, the, uh, certainly the kind of historical uh, galleries uh, like uh, Memorial uh, that have these strong uh, collections with the way in which you present uh, current issues, uh, current uh, art, which particularly, uh, Jonathan, as you know better than I, if, they, if, it's a, if it's a woman or an African-American or a Latinx or an Asian, if it's any person of uh, a, a, a non-white identity, um, uh, there will be more likely than not a political dimension to the work. Um, and, and there is no way around that. And, and I don't think that you should try to get around it. Okay, I, we won't. We won't try to get around it, and we 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 aim to um, engage uh, with with these artists and and this artwork um, responsibly and in a way that helps to educate our our, our audience and uh, providing a, a proper intellectual context for understanding right. the expression. Thank you. Um, a lot of great questions uh, in our Q and A, which I want to uh, now turn to. Our uh, board vice president, Marilyn Patterson Grant asks, in your 2015 Civil Society article, which I'm obsessed about, um, uh, you write, civil society's primary accountability cannot be to donors, end quote. Um, Marilyn says, in a time such as this, where there are multiple and complex needs for organizations and individuals, how do organizations such as the MAG balance their accountability and reliance on donors with authentic efforts to challenge the status quo in a civil society? Well, um, your board vice president asks the $65,000 question <laughs> uh, because it is very hard to, um, to balance that challenge, to thread the needle because often donors are conservative. And I don't mean conservative politically necessarily. I mean, in their taste, their interests, their appreciation, their belief in what a museum should be presenting. And we depend on those donors. Uh, we rely on, on those donors. Part of what I believe one has to do is the kind of donor education uh, that helps donors to see that it is in if they love the, the gallery, it is in their interest for the gallery to present uh, really exciting uh, work and to have public programs that sometimes make donors uncomfortable. Um, but uh, that comes with the territory. And if they care about the integrity of the organization, um, at the board level, these are, the, these are conversations that should be had, which are difficult. And again, I've had this conversation with many uh, directors and, and board chairs. Um, 
because there sometimes, unfortunately, are donors who have a mentality that is that it goes sort of like this. Well, we're paying for this place. It should be serving what we want to see, right? It should be, our interests should be reflected. Um, and the things that we don't like should not be reflected or our sen things that offend our sensibility. Um, the, this is where it gets really, really tricky because uh, we have always uh, had this challenge, but it is uh, accelerated as museums and all institutions. I mean, I talk about this with university presidents. I talk about this issue often with people who are in a public interest leadership role. You're running a big NGO. You're running um, um, an important uh, cultural organization and you're highly dependent on private donations. How do you balance that? I had a university president broke my heart who said to me, I read your commencement address, a commencement I did a couple of years ago where I talked about justice and inequality and the role of the university. And, she, and, and they said, I, I could never give that speech because I would be worried that I would offend an important donor. And I'm in the middle of a capital campaign. Um, I, I, I can't afford to say those kinds of things. And it just about broke my heart because I thought, you're a university president. If there's any institution in our society that should be about enlightening us, helping us see justice and the challenges, it's, but you can't because you're in the middle of a capital campaign. What a tragedy. And I think that's an extreme example, but this is where it can go. Um, and so I think your board vice president is asking exactly the kinds of questions that at the board level um, have to be grappled with and talked through. Um, and, and, that, and that takes a deft uh, hand uh, in Todd and uh, the other leadership as you navigate this, uh, because it's something that every museum in this country is dealing with. Wow. Um, I think somewhat related to this conversation right now, um, we have a question. Uh, I was uh, from Nahoko, uh, Kwaku O'Connor. I was particularly struck by your essay naming the challenges that many CSOs face and obsess over, specifically the fetishization of quantifiable deliverables. And you continue, quote, of course, we all want to get the most value out of our investments. But when it comes to measuring that value and holding organizations accountable for it, we need to be more thoughtful and flexible. Could you talk a little bit about some thoughtful and flexible capturing of values you have seen or you imagine? Well, I, this gets sometimes at the question that I uh, get from folks occasionally, which is your social justice foundation. Why is one of your biggest programs, the arts, uh, our work in the arts and free expression. And for me, this is a fundamental is a issue of justice. Uh, we can't have justice in society if we don't have the arts because the arts is a pathway to building empathy, to building an understanding of humanity. And from that comes a capacity to see humanity in all human beings and to be able to imagine putting yourself in the shoes of other people um, with Empathy comes humility. Uh, and these are qualities that I think that are essential for a, a more just uh, nation. Um, and so I, I believe the arts play a critical role and the humanities, how we think about uh, the narratives and the storytelling of who we are. Um, I, I'll, I'll, I will give a brief, I mean, I had thought of saying this, but, but uh, this, is, this is a sidebar, but uh, many years ago, the foundation started uh, at Monticello to fund the narrative project on Sally Hemings. Um, and uh, in part because, of course, we, we, we were all interested in this question of Jefferson and, 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 and Sally Hemings' children, which 
were always denied by the Jefferson um, estate and by the Jefferson society as it's known. Fast track, um, over the years, uh, we have known now, we know now quite conclusively through DNA and other technology that in fact, uh, Jefferson uh, was the father of, of her five children. Um, and two summers ago, I attended the, the opening of the Sally Hemings uh, exhibition at, uh, at Monticello. And uh, when I was asked to speak, uh, I reflected on Sally and how for a foundation like Ford, we'd invested over many years, not a lot of money, um, to a couple of researchers um, and oral historians putting together the papers. But how do we as the Ford Foundation evaluate Sally Hemings getting her dignity back? I mean, how do we evaluate the impact of a narrative that conclusively tells the story that Thomas Jefferson fathered five children with this woman. And how do we think about an evaluation for that project? There is not an evaluation that can do justice to assessing the impact of that grant on how race is understood in this country and how the subjugation of African Americans, and in this case, slave women and their treatment, how do we evaluate that grant? I would assert that there is no evaluation, but I would also assert that it was one of the most important grants uh, we made in that program. Tough, yeah, it's a complicated uh, matter for sure. And and, uh, in and art is that way. I mean, this is what art is. How do you evaluate? Um, how do we evaluate? Going back to Manet, uh, Denise Morel, the grant for Denise Morel to um, work on a PhD. Um, and she used that paper as the basis of completely turning um, the... Uh, curricula of modern art and our understanding of modernism going back to Manet through uh, all of uh, the uh, through Matisse, who also was influenced greatly by uh, a, a, a community of African uh, Caribbean women in Paris and in Harlem. All of that scholarship came out of a series of grants um, that we made, um, but I don't think that we're, we're going to be able to get um, uh, a capture on a spreadsheet uh, the, the, the power of that uh, grant. Thank you. I'm looking at so many um, all additional questions. Uh, we're not going to be able to ask them all. Uh, and and I, we probably have about five minutes left. Um, so I have to make some really hard decisions. Oh, make your decision. I'm sorry. I wish I had more time. I, I, I agreed to be on the governor's task force on the, on the, you know, rebuilding New York thing. And, and I'm chairing one of the subcommittees and we have this call and I would have stayed longer, but I, I have to. I appreciate that. that. We're so, we're so grateful. Oh, no, that I'm you're the here. Honor, um, Thank you, Jonathan. My, it's our pleasure. Um, uh, we're very proud of this moment. Um, I, uh, there is a question here, which is very topical, and it, 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 it actually speaks to my heart a little bit. You know, a recently a bronze statue of Nathaniel Rochester, right? The founder of Rochester. Um, he was a slave owner and a slave trader. Um, it was defaced and, um, you know, red paint. I'm reading of course. here. And, and the word shame was written on it, a white supremacy painted across his forehead. Um, the, 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 um, there's some back and forth uh, with the artist who made the sculpture, I think is what's being said here. But the question becomes, you know, this was a work of art that was meant to beautify a corner in a neighborhood. Uh, and, you know, so what, what advice do you have uh, for arts institutions that are, you know, or, or cities that, you know, are displaying public art that may 
that don't seem on the face of it to be, I mean, you know, the, the narrative is not one of oppression or suppression, um, but, but then they're being interpreted in much deeper ways, I suppose. Yes. Yeah. What's your take on all of this? Um, how, how, how do we manage this, this challenge where, you know, uh, where people are seeing, some people are seeing these sculptures, some of them statues as, as, as um, you know, sending the wrong message, of course. Well, I mean, I think when we see the national movement around the Confederate monuments, um, I, for me, from my standpoint, um, that, the uh, urgency of taking those monuments down. Um, they were never uh, erected uh, with any other uh, mission other than to uh, intimidate and terrorize black people. Uh, so uh, I, I believe that they should go. I think once you move into um, uh, people across historical figures across American society. Um, I think uh, it is going to be important to have the kinds of open discussions. I think it is a serious mistake for uh, protesters to take it upon themselves to uh, deem a statue um, destructible. I mean, I, 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 I find that problematic. Uh, I believe there, there has to be uh, an urgent uh, attention by cities, by universities, etc. But I don't think this is something to be decided by a group of protesters. Um, I think it's, that's a real mistake and I think could potentially um, do more harm to the ultimate objective of actually removing um, from the public square those truly odious um, historical figures who do not deserve our adulation, but I do not believe that it is uh, a good strategy to just start defacing and uh, destroying um, public mon monuments and markers. Sounds like you're, you're uh, proposing a very um, robust conversation around the meaning of these objects. And, mm -hmm. and how people interpret them, how they, um, what they infer from them, uh, and, and a case by case basis. Uh, exactly. And a, and a public conversation. But it's a public conversation that has to be led by mayors and city council people and university committees. And I mean, um, those are the, the appropriate fora. Um, it's not to simply open it up for anyone who just decides that they don't believe a particular monument is appropriate. Uh, final question. Can I? Yes. Okay. Um, it's a good, uh, as, we're, as we're developing our new muscles, which you referred to at the beginning of this, um, as, as, as a board and as leadership of this organization, what further readings or articles would you recommend for the board to read uh, to enhance our understanding of how art museums fit into society as a greater whole? Hmm. Do you know, I, uh, I read a lot of blogs and media. I have not, if I am to think of it, I'm not uh, off the top of my head. I have, a, I have a series of places I go for information uh, because I'm an I'm a online person. I just read everything online. So I actually am not a paper person anymore. Um, um, and and there haven't book. been any books that I've gotten on Kindle or that, I, that are art related. I mean, there are historical books. I mean, there are things that are reassessing, but not anything that is, this is what a museum needs to do to, I mean, maybe that's a good book for you, Jonathan. Um, I do find that when I read sites like Hyperallergic, um, Artnet News, um, Artsy.net, um, some of the um, uh, newsletters from museums like the Studio Museum in Harlem or El Museo um, or the Underground Museum in LA. I just feel like I am getting 
in real time a sense of where things are going. I mean, so much of my work, our work is trying to figure out where the puck is going um, and thinking. And when, you, when you're getting the kind of essays and critical analysis and reviews that you don't see in the New York Times or the, or the Wall Street Journal or the Washington Post, I, I, I just feel like I, I learn a lot. Thank you, Darren. Thank, thank you. Thank you Jonathan. so much. Oh my gosh, it's a real treat for me. It's a huge honor to uh, have this time to spend with, with you and, and your board of managers. And uh, it's, it's really great work that you're doing. And it's a great uh, gallery that I know is making a difference. And um, we're going to continue to look for exciting things to be coming from you in the years ahead. Thank you very, very, very much. Okay. I'll okay. sign off now. Bye -bye, Take Darren. care. Have a great afternoon. Bye, and, Jonathan. Bye-bye. Uh, to all our special guests, the Director's Advisory Council, um, and, and uh, everyone who joined us today, uh, thank you for, for being here. Thank you.